good friend Steve Rosenthal, condos, co-ops, and corporations, as he said, and I stole that line. Uh, it, it's, to me, a big part of this, and we need to move this agenda, this progressive agenda forward, and I'm hoping that I can be a part of it. All right, we have found our good friend, Mark Taylor Canfield, of course, the great journalist from the Pacific Northwest, and, of course, uh, somebody who has followed the Sanders uh, revolution, if you might, and he joins us on the phone from Seattle. It's been a busy day for you, Mark. Thank you for uh, taking a few minutes out to check in. How are you? Been a long time. Yes, I've been very busy with my music, making music videos, and started this little animated cartoon series about Amazon, the Jeff Bezos empire. So, yeah, I've been very busy. Plus, I took a vacation for a while, Jeff, so I got away from news. <laughs> and politics for a little while, which was very refreshing. Believe yeah, me. I can imagine. Of course, where you're hearing the the uh, great tune of Mark Taylor Canfield, his intro song, and um, you know, there's there's nothing like it. Uh, and of course, Mark, as he just said, is not only a uh, a great journalist, but somebody who is. Uh, a talented musician as well. I, well, you know, good for you to take some time away. You know, we've been off for uh, a couple of weeks now uh, in regards to the uh, focusing on the election that I'm that I'm involved with, and it's it's very interesting, Mark, uh, talking to people as you have in your in your great uh, work, uh, you know, on the streets. And I, I find, you know, at the street corners, uh, the grocery stores, at the uh, subway stops, are known as the T stops here in the city. Uh, you get to meet a lot of people, and they give you their opinions. Some of them, you know, uh, want to talk to you for half an hour when you don't have that much time. Or some will just say, uh, I don't want to. But more than not, people are, are interested in giving you the time of the day. And, and I think that, you know, we just talked to Shannon Jackson over at Our Revolution, the executive director. Uh, and I just think that there are so many people who uh, understand uh, now that they want to see their government work for them. And, you know, you're, you're seeing, you know, you guys understand that in, in, in with, the, with the wildfires and so forth. And, uh, you know, if, if government sort of gives you the middle finger, you know, you're going to have more problems. So talk to me about that because you've been, you've been talking, you know, on how police, you know, uh, patrol the streets uh, in Seattle and, and the, uh, the powerful Microsoft and other big businesses there. Uh, a lot to have. One of the things that's going on is um, there is a convergence um, called the People's Convergence taking place in Washington, D.C. And uh, so some of the main organizations putting that together are the Draft Bernie organization, also um, the Progressive Independent Party and Socialist Alternative. So our own city council member, Shama Swan, is there in Washington, D.C. from September 8th to the 10th uh, talking about some of these pressing issues. Uh, what will it take to defeat the right wing and build a powerful alternative? And, you know, should progressives continue to fight to reform the Democratic Party or should they launch a new independent party, which might be a little... Uh, less controlled by corporate money and influence. And so those are a lot of things that are happening um, in my part of my neck of the woods, as they say. That's what people are talking about here. Um, that's what people will be talking about in Washington, D.C. And uh, the Bernie Pratt revolution uh, continues in the Northwest. It has not gone away. It has caused some permanent changes in the way people think about politics in the Northwest. And it's also brought about a lot more personal engagement among uh, people in my community. People are much more interested in what's happening politically. They're willing to show up at city council meetings. And, and by the way, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you are in the middle of that local political process yourself. And congratulations, by the way, to people in Massachusetts for legalizing recreational uh, marijuana. I just wrote another article at the Capitol Hill Times about this issue, about this um, story that has legs, you know, that's moving across the country, this trend that is, what, there's now, uh, what, eight states, a district of Columbia that have legalized the recreational use of marijuana. And then, of course, medicinal marijuana is has been uh, approved by, I think, what, 26 states now. So it's quite prevalent across the country. But changes are happening despite the entrenchment that you hear from the folks 
in the GOP and in the Trump administration, things are moving ahead despite uh, this um, momentary setback in, in our national seat of government. But in Washington state, people are looking ahead and we're still looking towards the progressive Bernie Sanders um, style of movement, whether it's in the Democratic Party or outside the Democratic Party or in a coalition with the Democrats. People here are are moving towards the progressive uh uh, direction of things and this convergence in Washington DC is one example of people who are trying to organize nationally and of course Shama Sawant and Bernie Sanders and um, Dr. Cornel West who will also be there in Washington DC are have been very outspoken and uh, very activist progressive leaders so people are, are looking to folks like that to show where, what's the next step where do we go from here we we have a mess after this last election what do we look for in terms of the future, in terms of a, a progressive movement? Where are we going from here? Well, there's no doubt. Again, talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield, great blogger. You can catch him online and Twitter. Uh, and, of course, a great musician as well. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a brief time out and come back and, uh, and continue the conversation with Mark Taylor Canfield. You can join in the conversation at 772-925-8206. You can email me, jeff at revolutionboston.com. Check us out. We're back. It's the Jeff Santos Show, 49 minutes past the hour. Talking to our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield, great journalist, great musician, and a great friend of the program as uh, we return here on this uh, hurricane edition of the Jeff Santo Show. We're taping today on this Friday uh, for Sunday's uh, show because, uh, well, our production facilities, uh, good friend Ron Kreider and his uh, great associate uh, Bob, uh, Krinky is, uh, they're both battling and batting down the hatches there in uh, Vero Beach, Florida. So our thoughts and prayers go out to both of them and all the residents, of course, uh, of uh, Florida. And, um, you know, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's really become evident, uh, Mark, that, um, you know, we need to, you know, again, have an effective government. And when I was talking with Shannon, I think that a lot of people who are inspired, uh, and I don't know if you continue to see this, you just say that a lot of people are inspired by Bernie, you know, because government has to work. Because if it doesn't, we're all screwed, dude. Um, you know, I mean, I know you know that, but I mean, I don't know if people understand how important it is. And the evidence is, you know, front and center. I mean, in the climate change, we just talked to Rona Fried about this earlier on. You know, I mean, it's, it's no doubt, and we get heavier, heavier storms, more dangerous storms back to back within, you know, a couple of weeks of each other. So, you know, it, to me, it all it all sort of connects the dots. And, you know, you, you need to have good leadership, good effective government. Otherwise, it just, you know, falls apart. And, and the only people that, are, that benefit out of it, and that even that is questionable because really everybody needs it, is sort of the wealthy who can, you know, buy their, their own roads and buy their own planes and, you know, don't need government as much as the most people. But that's, that's still not really where, you know, we need to go. Your, your thoughts on all that? Because, again, you know, I know you spend a little time away from, from doing your, your great journalist work, but you probably can see it in the day-to-day -day life uh, up and down. Bob Hostagawa, who's a state senator, longtime proponent of a state bank, jumped into the race. Um, long time, he's also a longtime labor leader. Um, uh, Nikita Oliver, a local poet and educator, um, did very well in the primary. So a lot of people are getting involved here. And it is evident, by the way, Jeff, I have to say this, it's really great talking to you and, you know, my, uh, I really missed talking with you i know you've been really busy with your campaign and i i've been off doing my stuff too my thoughts also go out to ron Kreider down there in florida and also some other folks i know who live down there that's where uh, nicole sandler's at trying to do her show and there's a lot of you know really interesting people in florida trying to do the right thing and my my heart goes out to all of them to everyone down there um but, you know, I, I did want to say this. If you are a rich person, and I, I doubt that your billion-dollar uh, portfolio is going to protect you from that fire if the local fire departments and the state forestry departments don't have their act together and don't have the people out there to help protect your property. So it doesn't matter how rich you are, you still need government services and you still need those folks 
who get paid, hopefully, very well with good benefits from um, our state governments to take care of things like these emergencies. I mean, and the, also the federal employees. We need these people. They are very important workers. Their work could save your life. So, come on. We need to fund emergency services in this country. It's one of the things that makes us a civilized country. I wonder sometimes if our political representatives or even our political system is up to the task of addressing some of these major, major challenges in the world right now. But we got to do our best. And the first thing you got to do is you have to have some kind of pool of money to pay the state, uh, county, city, federal workers. And you got to fund those programs that take care of people. You got to have those people out on the front line trying to help. Um, stop these fires and and save our communities. I mean, it's just very important. All of the EMTs, uh, the police out there, all of the workers, the sanitation workers, um, all of the people who try to take care of our parks and our schools, they need to be paid well and they need to be taken care of and they need to be acknowledged and um, thank God they're there. Thank God. It is so true. Uh, we're talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santos Show. And, and like uh, our previous uh, rendition of the weekday uh, Jeff Santos Show where Robert Craig and, and Mark Taylor Canfield would follow each other, we're going to do the exact same thing as Robert will join us. And I know you're a big fan of his too, Mark, uh, at about uh, six minutes past uh, the third hour of the program at 5.06 Eastern Time. Um, one of yeah, the my things, favorite guests are on your show today. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> right. As well, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll indeed. No, it'd be great. Um, well, you know, I just, I just think about, you know, how Seattle, and I remember those, those visuals uh, coming out of Safeco um, with, you know, thousands of people, you know, cheering on Bernie uh, and getting engaged in the process and, you know, I, I just think that, you know, Seattle has started so many of their own revolutions of sorts, um, you know, high tech and coffee and everything else. But, um, you know, I, I, I really believe and I think we've seen evidence of of this, that, you know, the, the single payer, the, afford, the uh, four years of free public university are taking place in two of the biggest states. Single payer is getting close in California. Uh, Andrew Cuomo. Um, has already authorized or has put legislation forward on four years of uh, free public university. So, you know, in two of the of the three biggest states in the country, uh, you see um, the mark on, on Bernie Sanders. Four years ago, um, when um, the Democrats had a race for governor, uh, you couldn't get anybody but the least, um, you know, fringe candidate uh, running for governor uh, in Berwick, uh, to be a single-payer advocate. Now all three Democratic candidates have come on board for single-payer health care. So, I mean, you know, the people who got involved... Well, right now we have two mayoral candidate, candidates, um, and one of them is Jenny Durkin, our former uh, state attorney. Uh, there's also uh, another woman running who's relatively unknown. So... Uh, she is definitely a progressive and sort of um, a uh, favorite of uh, some of our local underground uh, political magazines and newspapers. So Seattle is still moving in that direction. And I, I guess I'll just, I'll just quote my editor, Dean Edwards, from Democracy Watch News. The majority of the people are becoming more and more progressive and moving more and more to the left. And that is the demographic of the millennials and the folks that are coming up into the political system. So get used to it, folks. That's the future. I agree. Uh, Mark Taylor Canfield, enjoy you making your music. Enjoy your time away. We'll look forward to talking to you over the next couple of weeks, too, man. Thank you so much. Love you, Jeff. Great to hear you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. See you soon. <laughs> See you soon. We're right back. Robert Craig's on deck. It's the Jeff Santos. Well, when that happens, I, the last time I saw, there weren't a lot of great people <laughs> marching into the third right. <laughs> well, I think that's just indicative of the kind of uh, narrow, I should say, myopic uh, vision that our president has. You know, you can't see the distinction or the differences, and that's just absolutely abominable. One of the things about all this, and uh, I guess we should have been prepared for a lot of it uh, during his whole campaign, he made it just absolutely clear that 
You know, he had nothing but menace on his mind. You know, That's nothing right. but danger and nothing but uh, injury, you know, for the whole democratic process, in fact. So uh, now we have all these things, the reality of these coming home to us, and I hope we come home with a lot of those people in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And, and, and it seemingly it is, if we look at the latest polls, it suggests that the whole declining popularity that this president has is absolutely unprecedented. You know, and under 40 percent in those major, three major uh, states where it was very decisive in his victory. Uh, but, you know, the, the pardoning of Sheriff, Sheriff Arpaio, again, he had promised to do that. He warned us of that eventuality, and there it is, you know, he's pardoned him. And here's a man, a sheriff, who had nothing but a contempt you know, for the law and for the Constitution and certainly the racial profiling that was going on out there, the absolutely in, inhumane treatment that he was giving people, after, uh, Hispanic uh, so-called undocumented illegal immigrants, aliens are there. And at the same time, you have a president who pardons him, who nothing but contempt, you know, for the Democratic process the so-called rule of law to say nothing of the Constitution. So all of these things are coming home to us in such a miserable and such a devastating way. Uh, we said the other day we were talking about him going down to Corpus Christi. It was just like one disaster meeting another. Yeah. No, I mean... <laughs> It's exactly the case. Um, you know, I mean, you know, the, 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 where the orange hair blows, it, it blows all over. Um, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just think, though, that, I mean, you know, if, if you think about the fact, um, you know, that we had for the first time in the history of the country uh, an African-American president. And mm. to think that, you know, the progress that we made in the 1960s with the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act uh, you know, the progress we have made in the gay community and the women's community and all this. And now we get the Neanderthal in chief. And, <laughs> you know, I, I just I just think that and I think this is why a lot of people, young people, um, you know, are excited about, you know, the Bernie message and the message of in government making government work for people. Because, you know, I mean, when you have and it's not only Trump. People have to realize, and even though John McCain and Murkowski and Collins, thank God for the three of them, otherwise we would have lost any kind of health care. But, you mm -hmm. know, we need, to, we need to basically say the fact that Republicans have been doing what Trump just sort of, you know, regards as the thing to do. Um, you know, government sucks. You know, we don't need the environment. We don't need the EPA. We don't need any kind of oversight on, 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 uh, on Wall Street. All these things, the Republicans have been doing this for 30 or 40 years. And Trump is just, is, is just you know, the tipping point. And I think people are realizing, as we see in the horrific hurricane in, in Texas and, and now in Florida, that if you don't have good government, you're screwed, man. No doubt about it. And I think a lot of this is that we've had a few... Um, what you call social commentators and um, historians and theoreticians, and particularly the, the political pundits out there who have been talking about the ravages of this administration since its inception. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing, you know, all of us seem to be on the same page in terms of our criticism of the whole Trump administration. I know I've been uh, almost on a weekly basis now for 32 issues of the Amsterdam News with a front page editorial like Make America Great Again, Trump Must Go. And, and you know, in doing that, Jeff, I don't have to struggle that hard for a theme each week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, you don't have to spend hours. Well, what am I going to write about no, tomorrow? No, 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 no. They're right there in front of you on a daily basis. You know, the front page of, of the papers have it all. I love what went down up there in Boston. I don't know where you were, Jeff, when, when uh, they was had it that at the huge... Boston Common. Oh, yeah. Right, oh, yeah. right. That was a hopeful sign, and I'd like to see a lot more of that where people are coming out in, in large numbers and, and expressing their absolute disagreement, how angry they are about how things are going in this country. But we need to have that, you know, from one city, from one county, from one municipality to another, 
But we can, yeah, and I'm, I'm looking for the union movements, you know, so it's a lot of people just so totally exasperated. But you do have these moments, and I think that moment in Boston was an indication that all is not lost. We're not absolutely fatigued. We're ready to get to the streets and say something about this administration. Well, no doubt. And I, and I think as we talk with Herb Boyd here on the Jeff Santo Show, uh, we're going to take a, a, a brief time out before we come back and continue the conversation. Uh, but, Herb, you're so right. And, and there is um, a feeling, and I see it on the campaign trail, that people mm-hmm. want change. Not, not change yes. just in, the, in, in a slogan, but change that really sees differences in their life. And I think that we are about to, uh, to see how this occurs uh, in these uh, municipal elections around, including yours in New York City with Mayor de Blasio, uh, and also, um, you know, coming up next year is when the governor races and, and of course, the congressional elections coming up, too. We'll be right back. Get Herb's view and your view. That's from uh, the great city of New York, Herb Boyd, as we come back here for the final few minutes of this uh, broadcast. Um, and again, folks, uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to our friends uh, Bob uh, Krinke, our great producer today, and uh, Ron Kreider mm-hmm. and family uh, mm-hmm. down there in Vero Beach who are battling, um, you know, Hurricane Irma. So our thoughts are with you guys. Um, mm-hmm. Herb, you know, it is, um, it is going to be important for people to understand that um, – if they don't get involved uh, and ed- and educated on these issues, then the same people who control, um, you know, the infrastructure, the political infrastructure, the power infrastructure of Wall Street, you know, right there in New York, um, and they control, you know, a good uh, number of Democrats, and of course they control the entire Republican Party, um, mm-hmm. and you know, and and this this is where you know. People have to get to the streets. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about this you know, a number of times in the show, but they, what Martin Luther King did, you know, is open up the idea of protest, um, yes. nonviolent protest. And we need to continue that. And as you were saying earlier, you know, the people in Boston showed that. And people around the country uh, have shown what, you know, what nonviolent uh, protest has done during Black Lives Matter and other places. And, you know, this this to me is where we need to go. This is the direction we need to see more of, not less, not this mm-hmm. idea of what Mitt Romney said back in 2012. Oh, you got to go in the quiet room, <laughs> you know, the, the quiet room, you know, guarded by, you know, a bunch of uh, of thugs outside in a uh, in a suit coat. Uh, and when you get inside, you're told either to sort of, you know, go with what the chairman says or you're out the door on your butt. Um, you know, that's that's what corporate America is about, right? No doubt about it. I mean, I think one of the things we also need is that, and and what the kind of work you're doing and you've been doing for, for, for years now, and it's good to have you back on the air again, and we can never know from moment to moment how long we can sustain your voice and keep it out there, and the kind of issues and ideas that you represent because it's a far cry from the kind of delusional and an irrationality that's coming from, you know, from, from the higher levels of government in this country. And, no and it's a shame that our masses of people have been so, what you call, hoodwinked by a lot of this. They can't see the distinction between delusion and, 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 uh, and, and rationality. You know, that something that's absolutely sensible and, sens- and, 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 and and realistic is suddenly confused, you know, with fake news and liars and blabber, you know, and, and, and these here kind of uh, erratic tweets coming from a president. You know, so, I mean, I, I know we're in an age, a digital age we live in, and, and it's so easy to kind of just do these kind of e-blasts out there and put all kind of Mis- uh, distorted information about what's going on and how his ego, this particular president we have, you know, is just nearly as something Prince said, this is psychopathic, you know, in his behavior, is that we need to find a way to not only be kind of drawn into the distractions that he's a part of, but to keep our eyes on the prize. You know, we got to 
So find true. those moments like happen in Boston and, 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 and play them up. The media didn't play that up at all. I mean, they just said, hey, boom, a bunch of folks showed up. And that was the end of it. It was no analysis, no way to how we can sustain that. Some alternative uh, uh, presses certainly jumped on it. I, I love what Counterpunch and, and the nation did about it, but we need to have a little bit more action going, even from some of the uh, the African American publications. Got to find the essence of that. In the same way, they found the essence, you know, in Dr. King and and, and Malcolm X. You know, we, there's some energy there that we could use. There's a perspective there that's very, very. It's a utility for us to understand exactly that distinction between, you know, the kind of rationality and delusion that so many people are caught up in these days. we got a lot of work to do, huh, Jeff? A lot of work, my friend. You say it so well, as you always do, Herb. And, and you know, uh, we, we, we need to, to, to continue to inspire, um, you know. And, you know, I ran into, you know, a few people at the protest a few weeks ago, part of the Black Lives mm-hmm. Matter movement, um, you know, and, and I see occasionally, you know, when I'm uh, out there at the tea stops, I run into somebody, you know, who has the T-shirt or whatever. And, you know, <laughs> they, they, want, they want to see, you know, government work for them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because they know they need it. You know, they're not a millionaire or a billionaire where they can have their private jets and, you know, toll roads that take them to their mansion and, you know, have their private beaches and golf clubs and all that. Um, mm-hmm. They need public funds for public transit and public education and public health care. Um, mm-hmm. And I just think that, you know, uh, we need to, as as Democrats, as progressives, um, as people who want to see a diverse government that reflects everybody. I mean, you know, I mentioned, you know, Reverend Jesse Jackson on the show many times, but he said something not too long ago. He goes, because Trump wanted to send in the, um, uh, the National Guard to the south side of Chicago because of the horrific gun violence and, and violence there and the deaths. When Jesse mm-hmm. Jackson said, we don't want the National Guard Send in the other government. Send in the Department of Transportation so we can build things. Send in the Department of HUD so we can have mm-hmm. housing. Send in the Department of Labor so we can have jobs. You know, that's <laughs> what they need, and it's so true. But, you know, no Orange Head it. doesn't <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> well, see, that's a rational perspective right there in terms of the actual armies that we need. You know, we need these kind of the, the development of our infrastructure, again, to get back to a president who made that promise during his campaign that he was going to sign over oh, the $1 trillion, you know, go into the infrastructure. And he kind of a measly million that he can devote to the situation down in Houston, Corpus Christi, to say nothing of what's going to happen after uh, Hurricane Irma here. Seem like uh, Florida, I mean, my goodness. So we got these, and here's some, a president who denies, you know, and kind of ridicules the whole idea of climate change and climate change and global warming. I think this is coming home to him in a, in a very terrible way, in a very unfortunate way. You know, this, it's a situation where... Done ...on a bipartisan manner. We put our country and we put the citizens of our country first. And that's what this is all about. The president is touting bipartisanship and said Democrats needn't worry that Republicans aim to give him a big tax cut for the wealthy. The rich will not be gaining at all with this plan. We're not. We're looking for the middle class, and we're looking for jobs. Uh, I think the wealthy will be pretty much where they are. If they have to go higher, they'll go higher. Frankly, Senator Bernie Sanders said it's long past time for a single payer system. The American people want to know what we're going to do to fix a dysfunctional health care system, which costs. Bidding farewell to its Cassini space probe. Here's Lisa Carter. NASA's Cassini space probe is completing its final orbits of Saturn. Project manager Earl Mays saying at a Wednesday press conference, the probe will fall into Saturn's atmosphere Friday morning and quickly burn up. The mission will be over within a minute later. There's, it's going so fast and the atmosphere is thickening so quickly that Cassini will be vaporized in maybe two minutes. 
NASA explained that essentially Cassini is out of gas, and if they tried to keep the program- I was one of the biggest critics of Obama in the And it showed that closer to what is termed a green space like a city park, the fewer the symptoms. What green space does is it filters the air, decreases environmental heat, and also provides children with a place to play and sort of get physical activity. And all of these factors help with asthma control. Kelly DePriest also tells us a city park or a green space reduces stress, which in turn can have an impact on someone's asthmatic episode. I'm John Clemens. Hollywood screen legend Olivia de Havilland is going to court at the age of 101. Lisa Carter with more. A judge in Los Angeles ruled Wednesday that Olivia de Havilland's lawsuit against FX Networks is set to begin on November 27th. Attorneys for the 101-year-old actress wanted the suit to be expedited due to her age. She's suing because she says FX didn't get her permission to use her name and identity in Feud, Betty and Joan. The series depicts the relationship between actresses Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, in which de Havilland is played by Catherine Zeta-Jones. Rebuilding America. Together, investing, activism, and supporting the middle class. Now, coming to you live from the Third Street Corridor here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Phone number to join us, 772-925-8206. You can email me, of course, jeff at revolutionboston.com. For those of you who are new to the show, Jeff with a J. And, of course, you can e, uh, check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Jeff Santos Show. Um, for a long time on Tuesdays, as I um, teased earlier, we would have uh, an hour um, with two of my favorite guests, uh, Robert Craig of Wisconsin Citizen Action and Mark Taylor Canfield, a great blogger and a journalist out in Seattle. And um, it is so important to have progressive journalists and progressive leaders in our think tanks and progressive organizations. And there's nobody better to start off the third hour than the executive director of Wisconsin Citizen Action, part of People's Action, our regular weekly contributor on Tuesdays when we're doing a Monday through Friday show, which we hope to get back to after the election in November. Our good friend, Mr. Robert Craig, joins us. Not the end of the world yet, Robert. Great to have you back. Good to be on with you, Jeff. Uh, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, sir. It's uh, great to have you on. We got uh, so much to talk about, but uh, we have to really start in, in your um, great state of Wisconsin. Of course, you guys just battling every day against Walker and that Republican uh, controlled state house. And what is the latest, my friend? I know it never stops there in Milwaukee. Well, the big controversy now outside of the state budget, and it's been bigger than the state budget is the uh, Taiwanese corporation Foxconn, uh, which made, makes iPhones and makes uh, iPhone screens and things like that, is uh, Walker is trying to pay them $3 billion to come to the state. It's the uh, uh, largest economic development project in Wisconsin history by 50 times. It was announced at the White House uh, with President Trump, and it's the most horrendous deal imaginable. In other words, it takes until 2058 to pay the state back its sunk costs. Um, from the standards of even bribing corporations, the amount per job is astronomical, and then many of them may not be created. And, of course, if you guys spend $3 billion on something like education, renewable energy, or health care, you would create not the, uh, not the jobs they're claiming. They're claiming 13,000 jobs at the plant up to that. And then they're claiming 22,000 indirect jobs based on kind of uh, uh, fuzzy math. But you could literally create 80,000 jobs if you directly invest it in education, just for example. So he's trying to steamroll this through the state legislature right now because his job performance has been, in terms of creating jobs, has been so horrendous. I think he thinks he needs it for it to try to run for re-election next year. 
It's unreal. Now, if you think about you know what they've been paying, and Apple has been obviously castigated and deservedly so on what they pay uh, these with these workers. Um, you know, well, Walker wants to sort of you know pay them below minimum wage here. I mean, you know, I mean, I know that they won't, but the fact is, is that this is the kind of crap that you get. You know, from someone like Walker, or what we saw with the Flint crisis with Snyder, you know, on and on and on, and what they were doing with Rauner and in uh, in in the state next door to you in Illinois. I mean, this is what we have, unfortunately, you know, in that part of the country. Uh, and you know, we, we're getting in here with privatization, Baker. Uh, you know, with our with our transit system, the MBTA, he wants to take jobs away from people who have them, who who do a good job and not invest in our transportation. And people literally are walking out into the tracks, you know, battling the, the, the rats and the mice, um, you know, because the trains aren't working. And, and this, this, to me, is just uh, an indication. But it all starts where you are. And it all started when people protested against Walker, you know, back in 2011. And unfortunately, not all the Democrats got behind you. And we all saw what happened, uh, you know, since then. Um, how are Democrats responding in Wisconsin to this this uh, sham that that he is uh, dealing with now, uh, the Foxconn uh, sham? It's a great question, and here's here's the problem, right? The Democrats as a group, not every individual legislator, right. don't have bold jobs plans, and so as a result, in many parts, like this is going to be in Racine or Kenosha, in the southeast corner of the state, they're presented with this bad proposal for jobs versus nothing. And you actually have Democrats arguing from a scarcity standpoint that we can't spend the $3 billion, which is absurd. As you know, we should spend a lot more than that, but we should also raise the revenue to do it, which they won't do, by having corporations and the wealthy pay their fair share back into our society again. And so most Democrats have been against it, except for the ones in in Racine and Kenosha County, uh, but it's been very divisive within the caucus. And in fact, the minority leader um, resigned yesterday. He's been there, and he's one of the ones who's for it. And so it has caused kind of a, uh, a one up one one person who didn't want to see the change of but they called it a coup. But what there is is that there is a progressive shift going on in the Democrats' caucus of the state assembly, partly over Foxconn. Uh, we've been holding events at, with our members all over the state and big press events that have gotten tons of press. But we have been talking about what kind of investments we could make with $3 billion and more to rebuild the state. And that's where we need to get the Democratic Party eventually as well, starting with the most progressive members of the uh, state Senate, state assembly caucuses. Well, I just think it's it's so vitally important that, uh, you know, progressive Democrats, we were talking earlier with Shannon Jackson, executive director of Our Revolution, uh, and uh, the impact that Bernie and OR has made in California. And now you see Senator Harris of California, more of a, um, you know, establishment figure, former attorney general, of course, joining uh, Senator Sanders on the um, Medicare for All piece. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, of course, another progressive uh, here in Massachusetts doing that. And that that needs to sort of be able to penetrate and, and, and penetrate, importantly, uh, in the uh, industrial Midwest there in Wisconsin, Illinois, in Michigan, Ohio. Um, I don't know if it's there yet, um, but it certainly needs to be. I mean, we talk about it every every cycle, Robert. We didn't, you know, last year and we did uh, in previous years that, you know, if you can win the hearts and minds of those in the Midwest, you know, you can you really control, you know, Congress and you can control the Senate. And obviously all those governorships, you know, can really be key uh, incubators, you know, for the rest of the country. And, you know, why we don't see a lot of people paying attention and focusing on this is really beyond me. I, 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 uh, I shake my head. Happening in these, it, I, I think that around governor's races, there's a lot more organizing going on now in the upper Midwest, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, and Iowa. And uh, quite frankly, uh, what we're trying to do is, since it looks like we have a field, we may have 10 Democrats running to try to take on Walker, but Walker may spend $50, $60 million uh, because he has national fundraising base and the Koch brothers and the Bradley Foundation behind him. What we're doing is we're not choosing based on personalities. We're trying to create a process, an endorsement process with a very bold statewide platform 
that drives the field to the left and tries to so, so, tries to create basically get a, a, a advantage any candidate who will run as a movement progressive and use parts of Bernie Sanders' playbook, which means running on big bold issues and firing people, millions of people to give small donations. Well, I, I tell you, I, I think that you're, you're right. You have to be able to give the small donations, and uh, that's that's going to have to be a big avenue here. Otherwise, you're going to be in in a pretty difficult uh, situation. Um, is are there ten candidates running for uh, for governor in Wisconsin? It looks like they're going to be. Not all of them announced, but there's a, there's a long growing list, and there are some major ones who haven't yet announced that we know are going to announce. Uh, so it's a wide open field, and uh, there's a huge opportunity for progressives, and we're doing it. Our revolution here would certainly like to be involved. We have a chapter here that's, uh, that's developed, and a lot of our members are members of it as well, at least some of the, mo- the ones who are most involved in electoral politics. And so, but there are multiple candidates that could run as movement progressives, and then even some of the traditional candidates have some very progressive instincts, but they we need to create conditions and incentives so that they don't listen to their traditional campaign consultants and actually run to the left rather than running a Hillary kind of careful bad quo campaign, which is a disaster given how many people across the upper Midwest and across the country, especially in the Midwest, think the system has gone wrong and want fundamental change, want a change in direction, want the status quo overthrown. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, I mean, we got this new book out now that blaming Bernie and Bernie Bros for the sins of uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, it's a joke, and uh, we haven't had. You know, I've been, I've been off for a few weeks now on the show. We haven't had a chance to talk about it, but you know, I talk to people on the street, and they sort of you know give me this snicker. It's like you know, well, I guess if you you can only blame the Russians so much, but um, right. you know, or it, or Comey, exactly. Um, you know, I, I just think that that's, that's really a farce. And, of course, it hurts the idea of the progression that we have seen. In talking to Mark, you know, he says the Sanders movement is really still very strong in the Seattle metropolitan area. I know it is in Oregon, and we saw the evidence of, of the, of the single-payer issues in California. And there's still resistance, of course. You know, from the establishment of California politics, Jerry Brown and the and the Speaker of the House trying to, you know, um, put a put a halt to the single payer action in California, which passed both uh, bodies. But um, you know, it's it's just it's just a sort of you know you gotta have to wake these folks up um, that the movement you know is is there. It's it's the young people are are, are involved with this. You know, I find more and more people that, you know, have kind of shut down off of politics, you know, over the last few years because they have felt that uh, they didn't they didn't get the the change that Obama promised. Um, They certainly were not inspired by Hillary. And uh, but they're realizing that that, you know, it's it's sort of Bernie or bust in terms of. Where we go, you know, we started off the, the show today, Robert, talking with our good friend Rona Freed of SustainableBusiness.com and a few of our, of our great callers and Peter from Florida, um, you know, discussing, you know, what the hurricane is and, you know, the, the water, uh, you know, being, you know, gouging prices there. And, uh, you know, all of this re- revolves around good government, which, of course, is what Citizen Action is all about. But it doesn't necessarily work in some parts of the country. I mean, you know, regulation is the dirty word, you know, in places like Texas. And we know we saw what happened, unfortunately, in Harvey. No, you're absolutely right. So our problem as progressives is is that we need to use our Democrat government uh, to reshape the economy, reshape the health care system, uh, transition to a clean energy economy to save the species and the planet, Right. And right. they've been trashing government and the incredible decline in people's regard for their own democratic government uh, since the 1960s has been engineered by the far right with some complicity by mainline Democrats who just tried to use it themselves occasionally but aren't the driving force. Um, and it helps conservatives and it does not, and the far right, and it does not help uh, uh, progressives. And so Trump trashing our government in a way helps them by further driving down regard for government. Exactly. And so it, Simply amazing. I was on a talk show yesterday on international relations on Milwaukee Television, and the conservative 
on the panel. I'm the progressive, of course. When I said, is it really a good idea for the president to be tweeting at foreign leaders and threatening military action against Venezuela and North Korea without any kind of, you know, check, no State Department looking at it? It's just straight out early in the morning communication on the international stage that could cause war. And he just shook his head. No, it's not. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't care. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, <laughs> it, you know, it, it is it is just it is just laughable, it, but also serious. Um, you know, when you hear, and, you know, not a band is gone and he's running Breitbart and, you know, I get all these emails through third parties and so forth. It's, it's, it is, it is funny, but it is also serious that these people had the, had the, uh, uh, the ear, uh, and the time of, of the president of the United States. You know, I mean, look, I mean, we all know, and I, I said it last night in debate that Donald Trump is a jerk. But you know we have to we have to have this institution of the presidency which we have to all honor. Um, at the same time, you know you have you have this horrific situation where you have somebody who's out of control, and then the GOP has allowed this to continue. You know, I mean, yeah, John McCain and and Susan Collins and uh, Murkowski out there in Alaska have done some good things, stopping the Affordable Care Act from you know falling apart and, and getting destroyed, but. But for the most part, you don't see them, you know, really putting an end. I mean, uh, I think that, you know, Mitch McConnell just sort of goes along and get along. Don't forget his wife is the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, you know, Ryan says one thing on one day, and then when they make a deal, um, <laughs> you know, like they did the other day on the, uh, uh, on, on the deficit issue, um, you know, he comes out and says, "Oh well, it's good. It's a it's a good thing because of Houston. What does Houston have to do with it all?" You know, so it's it's sort of laughable what's happening now in Washington D.C. for sure. But it hurts us as progressives, and so it does. we need it to. Does. So we need to really tie into people's feeling about the direction of the country and the economy, and their kids doing worse than 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 kids in the future, and people either being falling out of the middle class or continue to be shut out of it, which is a growing number of people, and especially uh, uh, low-income folks of color. Uh, but then turn that into a positive, we can do it, right? And that's what's lacking sometimes. And that's what the one thing Bernie understood. Bernie's charisma was literally was saying, yeah, we could have free college tuition, right? We could have a health care system that didn't rely upon insurance companies to figure out who not to insure and who to throw along the side of the road because they were costly, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to create a certain optimism that the barrier to us making this a great country and moving forward and achieving things we've never achieved before is us. It's our, it's our political system. It's our cynicism. It's, uh, it's a completely ruthless corporate uh, and right-wing leadership class. Uh, that's the problem, but we have uh, in more capacity than ever before to shape the future of this country if we would just reclaim our democracy and use it for positive purposes. Well, I, I tell you, I, I got to look at wh where we are. Um, you know, we're here in, in 2017 as we prepare for the 2018 elections. Uh, that, as I said earlier, you know, if 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 the Democratic Party doesn't understand that Bernie's ideas, which of course were Democratic ideas, you know, back when Roosevelt was president and and Truman and Kennedy and and, and Johnson, and then Vietnam came along, you know, in the mid '60s, and everything since then has been the Democrats have been on def defensive. You know, we we sell out uh, whether it's uh, you know in the Clinton administration on. Um, Glass Steagall and NAFTA, um, or we we see it with uh, with what Obama was doing on trade, uh, or or other issues on, on banking and Wall Street, and we're constantly on the defensive, and it's changed completely. Um, you know where the Democrats are, but you know what, Michael Moore's movie, um, you know the um, where to invade next. You know talked about the fact that all of these ideas that have been you know wonderful. Uh, revelations for people in Iceland and Denmark and Sweden, they all come from one place, the United States right. of America. It's, we've, been, uh, we've been sort of, you know, in hibernation on these issues and that Bernie has been talking about and people are doing. You know, you see the governor of California and the governor of New York are implementing uh, health care and education respectively that, you know, comes right out of Bernie. We get three candidates running for governor that are all for single payer. Now, four years ago, you couldn't get any of them to talk about it. So...
So, and the big change was the campaign finance system and the horrible decision in the 70s that said that, that money is speech, right? Yep, yep. And so we created, when we got rid of the party system, which was bad in many ways, the smoke-filled rooms, the Mayor Dailies. I know Boston had its own uh, b- bosses, political Oh, bosses, yes. Right? We had a mayor from jail uh, at one point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what happened is we got independent entrepreneurial candidates who raised money from special interests, and then the system escalated, so it got more and more expensive every cycle. And so by the time we got to the last election, Hillary Clinton, as a classic kind of A student who follows the rules, so to speak, thought that the only way you could run for president and raise a lot of money to win was to take a whole bunch of money from Wall Street, from Pharma, from all these other sources. And you could see her shock and horror that Bernie violated these supposed rules of political science, right? And right. raised all, more money than she had. And you could see her looking during the debates like, how could this happen? This is supposed to not be possible. And so we need to break that, that playbook and system because in a Wisconsin, for example, why on earth would you give to a Democrat gay for governor when you can just... When Walker has full control of the governorship and the state legislature, and you can just invest in the power structure now, and they'll give you what you want in return, legalized bribery. Why would you... Why would any of these special interests give to a Democrat? If they did, what would they want in return? I mean, if you take right. money from the payday lending industry, guess what? They want you to enable their predatory lending uh, uh, with people, struggling people, working-class people who are just trying to, uh, to make a living and get by and keep their houses and keep their cars, right? And down the line, if you take money from the nursing home industry, what's that for? It's to enable elder abuse. And so that's what has hollowed out the Democratic Party. Well, folks, we come to the end of the line. I want to thank uh, Bob Krinke and Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast uh, under incredibly horrific conditions down there in Vero Beach, Florida. So thank you to both. Uh, thank uh, Sarah Billingsley for a great job on the web. And thank you all of you for listening and calling and participating. And keep on fighting, folks. We're going to try to be back every Sunday going forward until the election and then hopefully soon after get back